back to Luke chapter 1, and um, let me uh, let y'all know about something. Um, I got a text from Chris, and first off, he said, uh, saw him last night, said, tell everybody, thank you for the prayers, and uh, he's praying for us, and um, he's in great spirits. He got some bad news today, though. They're going to have to go back in where they did surgery. I guess it's got some infection, or, or you know how, uh, something, yeah. So it's a setback, and um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's got him, you know, you know, you're healing, and then you feel like you're being set back. But, it, yeah, but you know, I'll talk to him and let him know that if you wasn't getting knocked back, you'd know you wasn't on God's team because Satan will make everything a Christian goes through hard as he can, and God will only allow him to make it as hard as God will give you the grace to get through. But on the flip side of that, I mean, they got Chris, he, he had some Romanian girl come, Chris was calling her Nadia Coleman each. <laughs> This Romanian girl come in there like a little fire plug. I mean, muscles and come in there. Chris said she worked like a dog yesterday. Just uh, so they really working him hard. But he, I mean, he's got such a great attitude. And he said, you know, they they like him down there because he's encouraging and talking to people. He says he's getting to talk to them about the Lord. So I think what Chris is seeing is what we all come to see eventually that. All things work together for good, even those that are hardest on us. Somehow, God will be glorified in it. So, y'all, please keep praying for him because it, you know, that's he, he's really. He, I mean, they're working him hard. That's a hard uh, thing. He does. Such a good attitude. He does. I mean, they already taking him. I know y'all never been to Singing River, most of y'all, but there's a bridge that goes downhill over the lake out there, and they already got him going down that and back up. It's, you know, it, it, it's he, it's tough. <laughs> All right. No, not, it, it's quite a while before you can get one because they got to prepare it to be able to. It's, yeah, it's got to be lots of things they got to do, yeah. But he's working that way. Yeah, but what, what, how does he go down? Wheelchair. wheelchair. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. I think they'd be like sliding down. I mean, it's in and they'd be like, oh, what is she lonely? Like, you know, he's like skateboarding. Yeah. <laughs> I, he, I, you know, I know that. Um, I don't, when you're not used to a wheelchair, I can tell you just being in nursing homes, you get in one and play around minute, you'll find out real quick that your forearms are not what you think they are. <laughs> quick. So Chris has got, you know, all of that, but he's working at it. And his attitude, I know the Lord will lift him up today and he'll get him through this next surgery. All right. Now in Luke 1, let's go back and let's talk about this. But let's talk about it first, the mechanics of it, because we always like to keep things in context. Now, what we've got here, people call this the Annunciation, which... I don't even really know what that means. It's an announcement of some sort, okay? So it's the announcement of the birth of Christ. And it's really in two parts because the angel says, verse 28, the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his sight and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Now watch the angel says. Here's the announcement. Fear not, Mary, thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now that's an incredible promise, isn't it? It really is. And it's divided in two parts. There's the promise. Now in comes Mary's question. Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be? You know, when we read that, I'm afraid we read it like, how can this be? But let's not do that. And I'm not saying she said it with this much authority, but in your mind, think about it this way. She said, okay, now how's this going to happen? Yeah. Tell me, how's it going to happen? Now the second part is his answer to that. Notice she wasn't chastised. You remember when Zacharias said, uh, how can I know that this is true? Basically, the angel said, oh, you want a sign? See, Mary is not in doubt. And the funny thing is, Zacharias had Old Testament precedent for what he was promised. His wife was barren. Could he see in the scriptures that God could do something about that? Yeah. Many times, couldn't he? There's no precedent for what Mary believed, is there? Mm -hmm. Y'all remember again in The Chosen when they're sitting at the table and they couldn't understand the Old Testament prophecy that talked about destroying the weapons for seven years. See, they're thinking in terms of a physical war. And Mary's sitting there and they said, well, how do, these prophecies, I mean, I just it, it's hard to see how this can be. And she said, oh, I know a little something about a prophecy. <laughs> you see? It, it's that same kind of thinking. Well, the, the, he now tells her how it's going to happen. The angel answered. See, she was asking a legitimate question. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Y'all know everything God has ever done, the Holy Spirit has been involved in. 
in the creation, I mean in the wilderness leading, in the tabernacle, you find me something in Scripture that the Holy Spirit's not involved with Father and Son always involved and yet sadly many times we neglect him in prayer you know when we pray we need to thank father son and holy spirit we couldn't even go to him in prayer without the holy spirit so he says the uh, highest shall over the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of god then he gives her a sign for her own knowing, he says, Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth hath also conceived. If y'all remember, Elizabeth didn't tell anybody. She hid herself. Now Mary knows Elizabeth, my old barren cousin, like Sarah, is going to conceive. See, it's a sign. It's, and what does she do? She takes off running, doesn't she? And goes down there and stays with her. So look how gracious God was to her. Can't y'all see now why he said up there um, in verse uh, 28, he says, Hail, thou art highly favored. God had highly favored her. And the word favor is the same word as grace. It's just we toss it around so much theologically that I'm, it's better almost to use favor. Thou has been highly favored. Okay, Now, um, hail, that word hail, Okay, up there in verse 28, the angel came in and said unto her, hail. Now, unfortunately, we tend to use that word like uh, hail to the president, hail to, you know, we tend to think in those terms, but it's not really what it means. It means rejoice, be glad, or Godspeed. Folks, it was just a greeting. The angel greeted her, okay? Good news. Good news, sure. So the angel greets her. Now, uh, Catholicism, again, has changed this word hail to mean something it's not, because we were taught again to pray, Hail Mary, Mother of God. Right? Uh, I wish I can't remember. I should have printed the words. Does anybody, you remember them, Courtney? You do? How does it go again? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now. Stop. <laughs> Did y'all hear what she just said? Yeah. No, I don't mean rude yeah. stop. I mean stop there. The Latin Vulgate, this is how this happened, okay? Jerome translated the Latin Vulgate. And folks, I'm not saying Jerome was lost. I, look, don't get into those arguments. What good would it do anyway? We don't know. But Jerome made a translation where he translated it into the, it's called the Latin Vulgate because it was the vulgar Latin. In other words, it was the common Latin language. And in there, in this verse, he, where it says, uh, Thou art highly favored, he put in there, Thou art full of grace. And you see that one error of translation. Look how that was used. Thou art full of grace. Courtney just said it. Holy Mary, Mother of God. How did, one more. <laughs> but, yeah, the first part was full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. You see what they began to teach was that Mary was a source of grace. Where are we told in the scripture all grace comes from? Christ, God through Christ. He is the fullness of God. All grace comes through Him. But do you see how that language could be put to seem like Mary was a, a metering, it out. metering it out? A repository of grace? Now what do they teach today? Exactly that. Essentially she just said, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Folks, do you see what that's doing? Yeah. That's going to Mary as a mediator, isn't it? And, and basically what you're saying is, and they'll even say this, Jesus might could deny you in prayer, but he can't deny his mother. Yeah. See, his mother goes to him, and she can get what you need when you can't. You see, that's kind of the teaching. Yeah, um, I actually had a priest tell me I had asked specific about that prayer mm -hmm. and how uncomfortable I was with it, and he explained to me, and his, his way of explaining it, was that she, the word mediator, she is a mediator just like you go to your mom to get to your dad. Mm -hmm. If mom tells no, a child, I mean dad tells no, sometimes a child will go to the mom and ask. Yeah. And he said, that's what you do. And at the time, why well, just lap that up? Yeah. So, you know, to common sense, we say, oh, yeah, that's good, isn't it? But, but y'all think, all we've got to do is let Paul explain it in t to Timothy. He said there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Folks, we need no other mediator. And again, don't, don't go thinking harshly of Mary because I can guarantee you, I don't know if she's aware of this today. I don't know exactly how that all works, but I can tell you one thing. When she does become aware of it, she's going to be horrified. 
folks horrified that anybody would ever worship her. She never was meant to be worshipped. Mary's a sinner like the rest of us. Was she a godly woman? Yes. Full of faith. Full of faith. She had faith, but you know, what does that mean? It means God chose her before the foundation of the world and dealt with her, didn't he? So don't, don't go too far in our you know, rejection of that doctrine. But um, one of the things we find out about this is that highly favored is only used two times in the Scripture, that particular word. Let me show you the other time. Go to Ephesians 1. What? Ephesians 1. They even have um, holy days of obligation focused strictly on Mary, and if you don't go, then it's a mortal sin. Yep. I mean, it's, it's nuts. <laughs> Hey, is everybody, for, you know, there's a book, if it's dry, dry reading, but if you can stand it, it is really good. I, Lonnie might have read it before. It's called The Two Babylons. Did you ever read that, Lonnie? And all a man does, Mr. Bailey, did you ever read The Two Babylons? No, I don't recall it. I'm going to get you a copy, okay? The two Babylons, and a fellow named Hislop, Alexander Hislop, I think was his name, all he did was he took historical documents and he showed what the pagan religion was. Paganism is not atheism. Paganism is a form of worship. They worship the pagan gods. Then he took Catholicism and showed exactly how all the pagan things have been carried over. Because you see, Constantine ruled a pagan empire. But Christianity come in and there were Christians everywhere. So he was faced with a dilemma. Half his uh, people profess to be Christians. Half his empire is pagan. So what does any good politician do? He put them together. And what they started doing is they started finding ways to give Christian names to pagan holidays and pagan customs. For instance, Christmas. They made the birth of Christ. Well, all it really was in paganism was the winter solstice. And they come, they, you know, they had another great holy day uh, in June. June 21st is a big thing for them. And we all know this is the changes of the sun. They worship the sun, moon, and stars. But they couldn't figure out what to do with it. And I think it was Pope Leo, I'm not sure, had an aha moment. He said, wait a minute. John the Baptist was six months older than Christ, so six months had... John the Baptist Day, and they called it John the Baptist Day. And all they're doing is satisfying, you know, and look, Mariolatry is nothing new. Y'all remember who the Jews were compelled to worship in the Old Testament? The Queen of Heaven. And they even said one time, when we worshiped the Queen of Heaven, we were prosperous and the economy was good and everything was great. When we burned our idols, everything fell apart. So they essentially told Ezekiel, we're going to worship the Queen of Heaven. Sound familiar? And look, Mary has been called by the Catholic Church the Queen of Heaven. It's in their catechism. And so it's nothing new, okay? It's just a blending of these two things. Now, um, the highly favored, though, anytime you find a word is only used once or twice in the Bible, especially once, or once by one writer, like in this case, okay? Um, Luke used it once and Paul used it once. Luke probably learned it from Paul being with him so much. But when someone only uses a word once, one time. What does that in indicate to you? I'll tell you, if, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you, what, if I ever use a word one time, if I ever give y'all notes and you find I've got a word in there, a nice big word one time, it ain't because I'm smart. Y'all hear me when I talk. It's because I got my thesaurus out because I was looking for just the right word, right? You know, the Greek word thesaurus means a treasury, and that's what it is, a treasury of words. In other words, when they're looking, you know, you, know, you say, what it? no, nah, that ain't right. No, that don't get it. You find it just the right. And it's that kind of word that we're dealing with here. Watch it in Ephesians 1.6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Y'all see, hath made us accepted? Yeah. Same word as highly favored. In other words, Mary, you hath been made accepted. Now, doesn't that fit our theology? Yeah. When was Mary made acceptable in the mind of God? Before the foundation of the world. Mary was elect. Okay? So uh, essentially read it that way. Don't read you are, like Sully said, pouring forth grace for lost sinners. No. Mary, you have been the object of grace, not the source, the object of it. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, I told you all about the Latin Vulgate. We did that. All right. This stuff about Mary, real quick, we probably need to deal with a little bit. <clears throat> all right. Look, it, it's been going on. Here's church history. We'll just say from the cross, uh, we come on down. We'll say here's 500 A.D. Come on down, 1,000, 1,500, 
thousand. I'll just put two thousand. I don't. Y'all get the general gist. But let me. You know what? Hold on. I'm going to erase that because as soon as I leave that line up there, I will get an email and said somebody said Troy said it's going to end. And you know. um, when when you deal with church history, you'll find out that look. The Roman church started out as the church in Rome. And then there were multiple churches. Well, the churches in Rome started out with pure doctrine. And just because you read someone was from the Roman church or what Constantine named the Catholic church. Catholic just means universal. He named that the church was universal. Just because you read that someone was Catholic back there doesn't mean they were a pagan. It doesn't even, folks, they more than likely believed justification by faith. But what began to happen? It began to erode and it began to corrupt, okay? And it started back here, you know, back in this period, but it gets worse and worse. But do y'all know the stuff with Mariolatry is basically recent? It really is. It's mostly recent, mostly in the last 200 years is this stuff. And if you go and you look at their doctrines, you'll see that um, basically the year their doctrine, in other words, they have these council meetings and they declare something new. For instance, one of the newest doctrines within the last, well, I forget the year, but really recent is papal infallibility. They believe the Pope was infallible, but then one day they declared the Pope is infallible. I heard Archie Bunker arguing with his Catholic neighbor Irene, and he said, I don't believe in no pope being inflammable. Well, <laughs> it's the, in other words, it was, a, it was a topic of the day. You see what, but that was a topic of the day because they had these council meetings. I'm just going to show you how some of these come. I wrote them down in my notes for dates, all right? The councils between the years of 1850 and 1960 produced this. They produced the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Okay. Anybody tell us about that one? I can tell you. I don't exactly. I didn't read. I'm sorry, y'all. I never learned it, and I didn't read up on it. The first thing I always think of is Frank O'Harris and Terry Bradshaw, the Immaculate Reception, right? <laughs> but the Immaculate Conception essentially, I think, says something like this, and this is their doctrine. I checked their catechism, and it does teach this. Look down. Go back over to Luke 1. And you know, someone would say, maybe, well, why is it important to look at these things? Folks, if you're going to run into a lot of Catholic people, and we need to be talking to them about the Lord, and it helps us to know what other people believe. It really does. So, look down when it says in verse uh, Luke 1, 38. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Y'all see where it says, be it unto me? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Vulgate says that, let it be. Essentially, what they teach is this. God made the suggestion and made the offer, but Mary, by her power, said, so be it, and boom, conception took place. In other words, Mary did her part and God did his part. Now, is there any truth to that in the Scripture? Yeah. How sure was Mary going to give birth to Christ? Just as sure as the world's turning, folks. It was before the foundation or she was picked by God. So that was the Immaculate Conception. That's 1850. How about the perpetual virginity? <laughs> you know, my first... <laughs> my first th thought on that always is, now how would Joseph like that doctrine? Really? You marry it, right? Now, how can you just destroy that doctrine? Because her other children are named in the Bible, okay? She was not perpetually a virgin. Why do they want to make her perpetually a virgin? To give her power. To give her some kind of a preeminence above the human race to make her Christ-like, okay? She was not, folks. She was just another saved woman, a very wonderful saved woman, but still a saved sinner, okay? Now, the other one that came in this same period of time is her ascension into heaven. Now basically what does that teach? That teaches she rose bodily into heaven. Mary finished the work God gave her to do and up she went just like Christ. Do y'all see what they're slowly doing? Yeah. They're making her Christ. Hey, okay, how about this one? How about her coronation as queen of heaven? Yeah. Now, look at this. Who is this really true of? Christ. Christ said, let it be, and it was, wasn't it? 
Christ was a perpetual virgin. He had no sin. He had no wife. Don't ever believe these new so fangled gospels that say he was married to Mary Magdalene. He was not. He ascended up into heaven when his work was done and he was coronated. But they say Mary was coronated as the queen of heaven. And then in 1994, their last catechism, big revision, they said Mary is the queen of heaven, the mother of the church, the icon of true Christianity. Do you all know what the word icon means? Yeah. It's from a Greek word, idol. She is the icon of true Christianity and she is the mediatrix. Well, what she does, she comes in between Christ. Yeah. Now, essentially what they say is, you go to Mary, Mary will go to Christ, Christ will go to His Father. Yeah. But if you read all their doctrine, they take it further than that. They say, hold on, you come to the priest, the priest will go to Saint so-and-so, he'll go to Mary. You see what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Folks, they're putting all these people in the place of Christ. Mm -hmm. And look, nobody's picking on them or making fun of them. Most Catholics really don't know this. I was never taught this. They don't tell you what your doctrine. You don't never, never anything about these things. <laughs> well, in the old days, yeah, you didn't know what they were saying, huh? No. No. No Bible. The Mormons do that today. They don't right. teach everything they believe to yeah. convert. Yeah, that's very true. They do. And I'll tell you the Jehovah's Witness do the same thing. Um, so this is all part of the world's being moved to a matriarchal system. Y'all know people, and I'm not a, look, I got nothing against you ladies, okay? But God set up a patriarchal system. Who did he make responsible for the house? The man who's responsible for it today. The lady. Is that how it's supposed to be? No, it's not. And you say, well, what's wrong with her? Folks, if I was a lady, Lexi says all the time, I don't want nothing to do with that. You got that, you know. In other words, who would want to wear the pants? You see what I mean? But the whole idea is the woman was set up to be something in the family. The woman is like the glue of the family, but the man is the patriarch. That man has the responsibility of the family. And what's one of the first things he's supposed to be responsible for. His wife. his wife teaches his children the Word of God. Right. Hey, huh? Just to add in, if you had a wife that was a good wife, hmm? you recognize that she's gone. Yeah, I bet you will. It, it, no. yep. it, it's deep. I bet you will, Sully. You and Mr. Bailey for sure. Right. And you know, y'all were blessed of God to have a good one. Yeah. He, I can add to that. In my experience, if you've ever had a wife that was wanting all that and was the opposite of all that. Boy, when you get a good one, you'll sure thank the Lord. I'll tell you, right, Wayne? <laughs> it works the other way around. It works the other way. Mr. Al's a good example, doesn't it? We got so much to thank God for in our daily lives. Folks, it's unbelievable. Now, do our spouses have faults and failures? Yeah. But I guarantee you, when that person gets saved, all of a sudden, little by little, the household starts to fall back in order. You just, it's daily, little by little, everything starts to fall back in line, okay? Now, um, the, the matriarchal system. Mary is actually, uh, how to go about saying this, they say that Mary uh, was rising up to a coronation, and look what she actually says. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. You realize Mary is here submitting to herself as a slave. You do with me as you please. Hey, that's what it really means. Um, Mary is doing exactly what the Beatitudes say. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Is there anything here that would lead you to believe that Mary is uh, in any way rising up in her mind? Or No. You know the only thing she says about this? She said, women are going to talk about how blessed I've been for generations. And they do. We're talking about how blessed she was of God. In verse 29, again, it says, When she saw him, the angel, before he uh, told her anything about Christ, she was troubled at his saying. All he said is she's been favored of God. Let me ask you all, who in here finds a surprise in your daily life that you are favored by God? Yeah. I do. It's constant, isn't it? I mean, I look in the mirror sometimes and wonder, why me? Don't y'all? Oh, yeah. and, and the only answer you can give is it's something in God. It's nothing in us. Or as Lonnie said, you pick me. Yeah. Folks, that's a way to look at it. When you get down on yourself, don't go too far. Yeah, we hate our sin and we don't like it, but stop there and say, Lord, you pick me so I know you're doing something. So uh, Mary was the same way. All right. <clears throat> Another thing about Mary is, again, it says she found favor. She didn't announce it. And he said, thou shalt conceive and bear 
the Son of God. Did he say anything about Joseph? No. Joseph had no hand in it. You know, over in Luke 2, you find when uh, Jesus was 12 and was in the temple, and uh, his mom and uh, Joseph came back and found him, and she said, you scared me and your father to death. You remember what he said? But he corrected her very politely. He said, no, I was about my father's business. He reminded her. Now, granted, I'm sure he called Joseph dad, stepdad, you know, and treated him with respect. But in the end, at 12 years old, did Christ know exactly what his mission was? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, Mary, Mary knew just as well as he. But how about did Mary also know the Scripture? Yes. Read her prayer. We won't read it today, but read what she goes on to say. Folks, she quotes Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. Do you think she was ignorant of Isaiah 7, 14? Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Did she know about the promise of Emmanuel? So what has really occurred to her here? I'm the one that's gonna, God's going to use to do this? I mean, would that not surprise you? She understood. I'm the one. And, and, you know, Jewish tradition says every young Jewish girl hopes she would be the one. I, I don't know how true that is, but I'm sure any godly girl, you know, thought about it. But when Mary hears that she's going to have this, this child by virgin birth, the first thing that must have confused her was her betrothal. Wouldn't you all think? He says, okay, you're going to conceive, right? And you're going to bear a child. And she says, but I haven't known a man. How shall this be? See, she's got to immediately think, how does Joseph figure into this? Because, folks, she was legally married. You couldn't do like we do today. Y'all know there's, uh, what's that actress's name, that real pretty girl from uh, the Friend show? Aniston. Aniston, yeah, that one. Every time I ever look at the headlines, I swear she's engaged. Y'all ever notice that? She gets engaged, and I'll tell you another one is Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Packers. I've seen him engage it's like five times in the last few years. Some people do that, don't they? My dad had a good friend growing up, Mr. Bobby. Mr. Bobby couldn't go out with a woman, but he had to get engaged. And my old man would pick on him and make fun of him. They called him Engagement Bobby and uh, Bring Along Your Bride Bobby and all these nicknames. <laughs> but the point being is back here, it wasn't like that. It was a legal binding contract, and under Moses' law, if you broke it, guess what the penalty was? Death. So here Mary has been told, you are going to conceive a child. And yet she knows virgin birth. He says the Holy Spirit's going to... Can't y'all see her dilemma? Where does Joseph fit into this? You know, all she could come up with, I'm sure, is by Joseph. I mean, you know she had to love the man. Goodbye, Joseph. But did God in his infinite mercy work it out? Mm -hmm. Same announcement sent to Joseph. Joseph's ready to put her away, isn't he? Yeah. And he's a just man. He's going to do it quietly. He ain't going to make a big stink over it like he could have. And God comes to him and says, no. That's the Holy Ghost that did that. You keep her and name that child Jesus. And he comes home and says to her, I, I had a vision. And he said that you're conceived of the Holy Ghost. She said, yeah, and we're going to call his name Jesus. You see how he gave the name to both? Uh -huh. Folks, God worked it all out perfectly. Now, um, the answer to how. One more time about Zacharias though, before we go on. Zacharias was in unbelief. Mary is just seeking instruction. It don't mean Zacharias was lost. I thank God for these examples. Zacharias had weak faith. Mary had strong faith. But folks, both of them had faith. Make sense? Did God chastise Zacharias? You know what that's proof of? He's a child of God. Mary needed no chastisement here, did she? You know, there came a time when Mary herself must have had her doubts. Remember when her and the brothers came to Jesus? When, when he was started preaching and she saw the uproar and all, they come to get him. Hey, come on, let's get you out here and go back home. You know, they were uncertain. Of course she didn't understand all of it. But did she understand about this birth? She understood she was going to bring forth the Son of God. He told her. Now, uh, as far as the answer to how, he said the Spirit of God would move upon her, would overshadow her. And again, that's exactly like it was in the beginning. God said, let there be light, and the Spirit of God moved, and there was light. So it's the same kind of thing. Now, um, I want, to, want you to notice something about the comparison. Now look in verse 15. In verse 15, we read this. Was John the greatest among those born of women? 
Jesus said so. Greatest prophet. In verse 15 it says, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Talking about John. Great in the sight of the Lord. But come down to verse 32. Christ, he shall be great. You see the difference? Mm -hmm. He's just plain great. One's great in the sight of the Lord. One's just plain great. You know, John was filled with the Spirit. Jesus Christ was conceived by the Spirit. You know, if you look at it, the comparison is very interesting. Zacharias, in unbelief, lost his words. Mary, in belief, brought forth the living word. It's, it's like they're night and day, both ways, aren't they? And so as you, as you make these comparisons, it's really interesting. But it's also to know that, again, the Holy Spirit was actively involved in this. And all the virgin birth really did was it not only was a miracle or a sign, but it preserved the deity of Christ. Think about it. If any man had been used of God, what would have happened? He would have passed his sin nature on. Hey, look, I am no doctor. Courtney can certainly aspire to, or can confirm that. See, when I try and use big words, I foul it up, Maddie. <laughs> but I wish Esther were here. Esther's the midwife. She really can explain this good. But God did something with woman. Way back here when God talked about the seed of the woman coming into the world. Did God already know how He was going to bring His Son of God into the world in a body? Oh, yeah. Did He already know He would need to be sinless? All right, and a woman, there's ovaries, but if I understood Esther right, the ovaries are one thing, but the individual eggs are something in there. Is it? Courtney, come on, you don't know. Y'all check it. Eggs are in the O. Uh, eggs are in the O, okay? But a woman, when she's born, basically is born with all the eggs she's going to have. Oh, they're there, okay? And, you know, each time she doesn't have a child, she sheds, and uh, y'all know all the whole process. But there's something about that actual egg itself, okay? That egg itself has no blood in it. No blood. All right, this is simple if we use common sense like we would understand. My granny would not buy eggs from anybody that kept a rooster. Now, we were getting store-bought eggs, but that was one of her old things. I don't get eggs, not if they keep a rooster. We know why, don't we? She got one that was fertilized. Hadn't y'all ever broke an egg that had a string of blood in it? What does that tell you? It's fertilized. The blood comes from the male. It's in the seed. The DNA for the blood is in the seed of the male. The, 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 the egg is like a, the place to incubate the seed. But there's no blood in there. Now look what God did. From the beginning of time did God create woman with a pristine place for him to put the seed. And so what does that allow to take place? Jesus Christ was born in a place without the blood of Adam. He was, you see what I mean? He had not the blood of Adam in him. Now, did he have blood? Yeah, but he didn't have Adam's nature. He, God set it up whereby through virgin birth he could preserve the deity of Christ when he became flesh. Does that make sense? All right. So, uh, can't y'all see why he was called the seed of the woman way back then? God knew what he was going to do. All right. Um, Mary's response again. Mary says in verse 38, I am your servant. In other words, Lord, if this is what you've called me to do, then so be it. You, you know best. Now, handmaid again implies uh, Mary's understanding of the suffering that was going to follow. See, Mary didn't say, okay, I'll be your priestess. She didn't say, yeah, I'll take the position. She didn't say any of those things. She said, a handmaid, a slave. Folks, this is what the term means, a slave. Y'all remember um, when God, uh, in Elisha's time, remember Naaman had leprosy? And Naaman had a Jewish slave that they had captured. The Gentiles would capture him and bring him home and make him serve, a young girl. And it's called Naaman's handmaid. And she told Naaman's wife, there's a man in Israel that can cure that leprosy. A handmaid is a female, it's a lowly position, okay? And so when she says handmaid, it implies again that she understands the suffering that's going to be involved in this. Now think, what's the first suffering she figures is coming? The embarrassment. The embarrassment, the loss of her marriage. Folks, how about her reputation? Let me just ask you all this. Do you all think everybody in Nazareth and Galilee believed she was conceived of the Holy Ghost? No. Then what do you think they called her? Oh. See? 
What do you think? I mean, many of her own family called her. I mean, everybody can see this, this was a lot of suffering that went along with this. So she probably figures that she's going to have to be divorced from Joseph, and that in itself is a horrible shame, isn't it? Um, she was also willing to sacrifice marriage, dreams, reputation. But what about later on? Folks, she suffers the ultimate. Think about it. What does she watch her son do? Why she watched him suffer and die. And I'm, I shouldn't say the ultimate, the ultimate for us flesh, isn't it? You know, she, she, I mean, had a life of ridicule. His birth was, had to be hard. No midwife. I mean, just Joseph. Uh, as soon as he's born, Herod wants to kill him. I mean, from the beginning, what was her life like? It was suffering, folks. It was a lot of suffering. She watched her son be rejected. She watched him tortured. She watched him crucified like a common criminal. Then she watched all his faithful friends abandon him and take off. Y'all remember she was there, but they all took off, didn't they? So Mary has to understand these things, but thank God that he confirmed to Joseph and gave him the same message. Because in the confirmation of Joseph, what did it allow to take place? Mary was able to maintain her marriage, wasn't she? And Mary had Joseph to help. Now, it would appear that by the time uh, Jesus is born, Joseph, he's never mentioned, so he's more than likely dead. But in the case of Joseph, did God make sure that Jesus Christ had a just mother and a just stepdad? He did, didn't he? So does having a saved mother and a saved father guarantee that you're saved then? No, it doesn't. Oh, but it helps. It sure helps. <laughs> it is a huge advantage, isn't it? It really is. Um, back one more thing about this before we quit. Whenever we talk about the house of David being raised up, okay, did God raise up the house of David? Yeah. Well, what else is that same house called? You know, people with, with a dichotomy of theology, they want to say, no, this refers here and that refers there. What else is it called in Scripture? It's church. It's church. I tell you all what, go over to Jeremiah 31. That's in the Old Testament, you <laughs> Jeremiah 31, 31. Yeah. 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. All right, I'm going to put them up here. House of Israel. And I'm going to put Judah. Now, when Jeremiah wrote, that meant something. It meant that a house that was divided, because Judah and Israel were divided, folks. There had been war. They were separated. They even had two different religions, okay, two different temples. He said, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Judah, I can see. But what else did he say? Israel. In other words, he said, this division ain't going to last forever. I'm going to bring you together as one. Did he mean politically? No. He meant, I'm going to save all the remnant that I'm going to save from Judah, and I'm going to save the remnant from Israel, and I'm going to bring them together, didn't he? But go over to Ephesians 2. What does this really picture? In Ephesians 2.11, and the, the theme of the book of Ephesians is unity in Christ. Essentially what he's saying is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God had planned to bring everything together under one head, Christ. Now people say the dispensation of the fullness of times is out there, but it's not. When did God bring everything together in Christ? After the cross. Ephesians talks about it. Watch verse 11. Wherefore, remember... That ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, he's talking to saved Gentiles, before they were saved in the flesh, he said, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. The Jews and Gentiles in the flesh are separated, aren't they? The Jew looked down their nose at the Gentile, and the Gentile probably hated the Jew for it, and you know, it was hard times, just like Israel and Judah. He said that at that time, when you were lost, you were without Christ. 
Well, of course, when we're lost, we're outside of Christ. We're in Adam, aren't we? He said, why? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Now, does this mean we have to become Jews to be saved? No. It means we had no part in the Israel of God. He said, you were outside. Outside of it, watch. Strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's all a description of what we are lost, isn't it? He says, but now, in Christ Jesus, instead of in Adam, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, both groups, who hath made both one. This doesn't mean every Jew and every Gentile. It means every saved Jew and every saved Gentile. He hath made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us. What was it that caused the enmity between the Jew and the Gentile? Sure. The Jewish ordinances. Circumcision, number one, right? But all the eating, we can't go around them. They eat pigs and they're this and that. Well, what did God do to make them able to coexist? He did away with the ordinances. He says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Folks, that has nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. He said, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Well, what else is the church then called? One man. new man. Now, I know when we get saved, we're a new man. But in this context, he's talking about taking two and making one out of the church. Watch what he says next. Verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body. Well, the church is also the body of Christ, aren't they? Reconcile both unto Christ, uh, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, came and preached peace to you which were afar off, the saved Gentiles, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye, ye again talking to these Gentiles, saved Gentiles, you are no more strangers and foreigners. Is that what we were before we were saved? Yes. He says, but, here's what we are now, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Are we fellow citizens? Yes. Well, fellow citizens of what? What's it also called? He called it the body of Christ. And up top he said you were strangers from the commonwealth of Israel. Folks, the church is the true Israel of God. And that doesn't mean what replacement theology says, that all the promises God made concerning the, the land and all the Israel, they wouldn't take, so He gave it to the Gentiles. No, it means that all along God was planning on saving His people from every nation. And we're all brought into one body, and we're all made the chosen of God, aren't we? So He says now, 20, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So the church is also the temple of God. Every time the Apostle Paul mentions temple, does he ever mean physical? He's always talking about the church. The one that people go astray on is when he talks about the man of sin coming and sitting down in the temple. Folks, that's been going on for a long time, going into a, what calls itself the church and sitting there and trying to rule, isn't it? So essentially, the promise that was made that Christ was going to raise up the house of Jacob, what he's talking about is he was going to once again resurrect a kingdom where God's people would all be able to live in harmony and peace together. Can we? And how long has that kingdom been going now? <laughs> Pushing 2,000 years, aren't we? And so what we find out is that the house of David, folks, is nothing more than the house of Christ. And all these different references, that Old Testament language that was used when you come over into the New Testament, all those promises God made to Abraham and to David, they all transfer to the church, not because God took them from one group and gave them to another, but because they always included the spiritual people, not the physical. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. Make sure you don't believe that the physical promises back here, God couldn't give them to Israel, so He gave them to the church here. No. All God's people that He picked got the promises, but they had a physical system back here that is fully explained when Christ comes and shows us it's all fulfilled in the church. Okay? All right, any questions about that? All right, Lord willing, next week we'll move on to Mary's prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank You for allowing us to gather together. Father, we thank You for peace and harmony that we can have. We thank You for having Your Word, and we thank You for having it where we can go to it over and over again to edify us. Lord, we especially ask prayer this morning for Brother Chris. Please give him comfort and strength. Let him know that he's loved. Let us show him we care about him. Let us take time to look out, to go visit, whatever it is. Let us let Chris know that he's missed and that his body misses him and we're ready to have him back. And let us all look at each other together with compassion, with mercy, overlooking each other's faults, and yet still dealing with you as you would have us do according to your word, never compromising. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Remember Chris prayer.